The invitation will be 404 if you want to hold out, 404. Our communion song, 139, 139. Years I spent I'll come to the reason that we gather on the first day of the week and <clears throat> I've mentioned this before in my meditations that <clears throat> this communion meditation was instituted for our benefit uh, because we're at constant war with our flesh and as I thought about this I thought about a movie believe it or not uh, called Groundhog Day if you guys remember that movie if you had never seen it the guy wakes up and he's doing the same thing every day is the same and same and in that movie he gets caught into this loop and he kind of just gives up and does the same thing every single day, just goes with emotions. And when you think of our lives, a lot of times, that's the loop that you can get in, right? You sit here, you take communion, you listen to the sermon, you sing a little bit, you head into the week, and you war with the flesh, and the same things happen over and over again. And you commit the same sins, either the same of the sin of omission, the sin of letting things be said that's not true and not standing up for the word or just any other sin that we encounter throughout the, our lives. Maybe not living in that sin, but continuing to have that sin and not trying to fight against it, just going through the motions. But another part of that movie that's similar to us, he finally decides to try to do something different. So each day he wakes up and he learns different languages and he does different things and he makes the effort and this communion is an opportunity for us to hit the reset button and to start the week and do something different every week, to follow in the steps of Jesus, to keep our eyes set on that that's above, not to just do the same loop over and over again. And, you know, we're not going to be perfect, but this opportunity for us to hit the reset button every Sunday is there for us. We can go to the Lord in prayer. We can ask for forgiveness of sin if we're a Christian, if we've confess that Jesus is the son of living God, if we've repented, and if we've been immersed to have our sins washed away to meet the blood of Christ, then we have that opportunity for this reset button every single week. In Colossians 3, verse 2, it says, set your affections on things above, not on things on earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affections, evil con conspicu conspicuousness, and covetousness, <clears throat> which is idolatry. For these things' sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived them. But now ye also put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie, lie not to one another, seeing that ye may put off the old man with his deeds, and ye have put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. All of us have struggled uh, struggle with the war of flesh throughout the week. Let's now set our 
Um, let's now reflect on the sacrifice made for us on the cross, Luke twenty two nineteen, And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This is not necessarily intended to say this is given for you to the apostles, but that you is every one of us. It's given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supping, saying, supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you, for all of us. Let's also reflect on the triumph at the tomb. Matthew 28, verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, <clears throat> fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And finally, let's look forward to that glorious home that's prepared for us. In John 14, 1, it says, Let your hearts not be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive, unto my, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be. Just remember what has been done for us and what that goal is. And as we go throughout that week and we start to get downtrodden for that war against the flesh, we can always go to the Lord in prayer and we always have this to bring our compass back to true north, which is on that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. I'll ask the elders to pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you once again for going back in your house this morning. We continue to thank you today for each and every blessing of life that we receive. We thank you now for the one that's made their way out here this morning. We bless you for fellowship with one with another as we come around the table this morning. We pray, pray that you'll be with us take this bread, this body that's broken upon that cross for us. Or as also as we do partake of this, we need you sent your word back this morning. But most of all, we thank you for the one who died upon that cross. He shed his blood for us. We just pray that you continue to be with us through the service this morning and be with us out this coming day. Help us to be more faithful to you and burden you better. Help us to be better people. Help us to do your things good. Go with us now as we partake and forgive us the first thing that we missed faith. And continue to be with those that have the from us this morning and kind of sick. Go with us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Father in heaven, as we continue in prayer, we're so thankful for the wonderful blessings you give us. Thank you, Father, for your love. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with us today in our service. Thank you for each one here, Father. Thank you for the help you give me to be here. Father, I do love you today, and thank you for all you do for all of us, Father. Be with us, Father, as we go through the day. Everything will be in accordance with your will. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with us now as we come around your table. Thank you, Father, for this cup, which is the same shed for us. I pray, Father, that you bless the bread and give unto me. Thank you so much for him and his family. And thank you for each one here, Father. My prayer in your son's name.
now come to the offering and you know Brett's talked about thankfulness many times and really the offering is an opportunity to show our thankfulness as well as our faith thankful to the Lord because he's provided for us everything that we possibly need need not necessarily want and we have the faith that he'll continue to provide for us everything that we need and I say need because there's many times that we want all kinds of things and in a lot of cases it's not the best for us the things that we want but the Lord knows exactly what's the best for us and exactly what we need so I'll ask Ken if he'll pray for the offering If you will stand, stretch our legs one more time, singing, I'm blessed. seated and everybody said amen. amen the Lord is good to us he loves us uh, how many years has it been since she's been here because I didn't recognize her yeah yeah but I thought sitting up here now she said she'd been here before and I started thinking yeah I remember her how old do these people make us now they grow so fast and so quick but as always uh, we're glad that you're here, uh, a lovely flat family that she has, and we like to see these people grow up and uh, see the important things in life and uh, see them having happy families and beautiful families. And uh, if you stay stick with the Lord, he'll take care of you and do wonderful things in your life. But we have to stay with him. We have to stick it out with him. And then everything will be okay. But like Adam said, we've got them from Florida to Carol to California here with us today, and we welcome you. We're missing a lot of people. We've still got some traveling. We've got many sick and under the weather, so we'll continue to remember them in uh, our prayers. If you didn't, men didn't get a gift, then you can go out the door on your way out the door, and they're there. They're uh, cool too. They're a little old. Glass Coke bottles. You remember them when we was little? My, that was the greatest thing in the world. Chilled and iced kind of and peanuts. Linda said, I didn't think nothing about Maybe they'll be eating them during the church service. I said, <laughs> I said, listen, these people are educated. <laughs> Paul, Paul says, do you not have houses to eat and drink? And it is a sin to eat and drink in the Lord's house. It is a sin and it's a dishonor to God. Put the peanuts down, Dale. <laughs> but we do know the Bible teaches against such. No one would. But we thank you for the gift, and I can't wait to have mine after my lunch today. As I sit in my recliner, I'll have to get it cold, though, Linda. You could have chilled them. You could have given them to us cold so that they're ready to go. Well, uh, Caitlin and Jacob said they wanted to thank everybody or those that attended the baby uh, shower yesterday. That was appreciated. And once again, happy Father's Day to each and every father that is here. Uh, 
Uh, we live in a time where fathers, fatherhood is a talent or a desire, may I say, that's been lost. I mean, about any man can bring, be a part of bringing a child into the world. That doesn't make you a father. And I've seen through my whole life some awful sorry daddies. But at least the majority of the time they were at home or they tried or they give and they were some part of a family. You can't find that anymore. It's difficult to find anymore. Uh, goodness, the number of sorry men that have been called fathers. Some of the sorriest never missed a day of being at home, never missed a day of work, but they were sorry individuals for the way they treated their family. And then on the flip side of that, you've got fathers never at home, didn't want to be at home, always found a reason to get away. They wanted to party. They wanted to enjoy life. They was equally as sorry too. I had one like that. I couldn't tell you when his birthday was. You know why? Because I don't care. I couldn't tell you where and what he did the majority of his life after 12 or 13 years old. You know why, John? Because I don't care. Because he was a sorry individual. I get sick and tired of seeing the sorry elevated to worship status. And that's what's going on in this world today. The sorrier the daddy, the more worship they seem uh, to receive and to get. But we don't find that when we read in the Bible. We don't find that when we study in the Bible. Those that were respected were those that led their families in the way of the Lord. And some point back for a long, long time, that's been a steep decline where people were worried about leading their families in the Lord. Too many men want to be their children's best friend. The boys will tell you, I ain't never been worried about being their best friend. I figure if I raise them right according to the word and with a moral fiber uh, that the, I'll prove to have been one of their best friends. But a daddy worried about being a child's best friend is nothing going to turn out to be but their worst enemy if they're not directing them in the ways of the Lord. How sad to bring up a child or children in the world and not raise them on a biblically backed foundation for them just to go and spend eternity in hell. What a cruel person that would take. Is that not cruelty? Then I hope you understand the importance of being a Christian father here today. If you're a mother here today and there's no father present in your house, then you pay attention to this message too because it's important to each and every one of us. It's a sad, sad situation when you consider the state of fatherhood in these days. Christians as dads were called to do a lot of things. A lot of things in the word of God were called to do. Teach. Correct. And by the way that correction is not putting them in a corner to count to a hundred. That correction wasn't called time out. It says if you spoil the rod you hate your child. Did you know it says that? And it also says you better not try to beat them to death neither. But there is a correction method and it's outside the liberal form of correcting that we see today. And fathers are called to do that. Fathers are called to set an example. Now, I don't know about you daddies. I've set a lot of bad examples in the last uh, 30 years. I've not done everything the way I should and done a lot of things that I shouldn't. Are we all not guilty of that? But our best example and our greatest example should always be no matter the wrongs that we've done, we've stood by the word of God and what it says and we demand our wives and our children do the same. You say, well, how can you demand your wife do anything? According to the Bible, I've got that right. If you've married a wife that you can't do that, then you messed up a long time ago and there were signs there that you shouldn't have hooked up with her to begin with. My Bible tells me when I open it up and read and study it that I am to have control of my family. When they leave and get away from here, they can do whatever they want to, son. But as long as they're under my control, no, they don't go to parties. They don't go hip-hopping around. 
They're uh, not going to concerts where evil is going on and evil words and smoking dope and drinking liquor and a bunch of heathens are gathered. No, they're not going to do that. When they get out of here, if they want to live a godless lifestyle, 1,000% up to them. But as long as they're under my roof, as long as they need anything from me, they listen to me or there's a price to be paid. You know why I say that? Because my Bible teaches as a daddy, I'm supposed to be that way. There was a man in the Bible built an ark. Do y'all know his name? What did he say about Noah? He said he was a what? He was a righteous man. It did not say his wife was a righteous woman, so God called upon them. didn't say his boys were righteous men, so God called upon him. He said Noah was a righteous man, and God called upon him. And because of Noah desiring to please the Lord and live, out and live after the Lord, him, his wife, three sons, and their three wives were the only people out of millions of people that were not destroyed by the flood. Kind of important for you to be on the Lord's side. Those that wasn't on the Lord's side, the vast majority... They suffered and died in a flood. But Noah and those other seven people were saved by water. 1 Peter 3.21 says, By water the same like figure where even baptism doth also now save us. Not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of good conscience toward God. That's 1 Peter 3.21. So anybody that's sitting here today says baptism don't save you. Baptism got nothing to do with being saved. Well, you need to read 1 Peter 3.21 because it completely contradicts what you think in your little brain. For we know that when a person repents, believing that Jesus is the Son of God and they are immersed in the name of Jesus, it's for the remission, the washing away of sin. You know why I know that? You know why I know that? Because the Bible says so. That's pretty simple, isn't it? It ain't a sprinkling. It ain't a prayer. It ain't a hip hopping over the stands or the pews. It's by being obedient to the Word of God. And that's what we need fathers to do in the church today. We need them to be obedient to what the God, Word of God says in its entirety. We need to be able to teach our children. We need to be able to teach them what it means to work and to accomplish something. Do you know how much that's lacked in the world today? A, a person that can work and accomplish anything? Is it not sad? They had a daddy somewhere in the background that failed. We need to be able to show our children that once you get knocked down in this world, you get back up and you go at it harder than you did before and we need to be examples of that. Now everybody's on pills and needs help left and right because they get knocked down, something don't go their way, and their life's destroyed, it's over. I was taught you get back up. My Bible teaches the same thing. Why are you there on your knees praying for your head in the dust? Rise up, get up, I'm your God, move forward. But daddies don't teach that anymore. It's a sad state. Fatherhood is used to be a time that daddies demanded their children have manners and respect. Do you see that in the school system anymore today? Teachers are scared to death of students. Scared to death of them. Manners and respect? I mean, you come to a four-way stop and you get there first and somebody else comes in another one, and you say, ah, oh, go ahead, ma'am. They'll go by and flip you a bird or something. You should have gone first, you know, you know. There's no respect. No manners anymore. But of all of the things that fathers are expected to teach, one of the hardest things, and may I say even one of the more important things, but the hardest things of all things we must do as followers of Jesus, as decent human beings, one thing we need to be an example of and to teach our children of is to be able to forgive. And I never thought about that till I went back and got into this story again of the prodigal son. You know, I spoke on it maybe last year or the year before last at Father's Day, but it wasn't on forgiveness. 
But man, what a story is in there. What an important bunch of information is in that story for all fathers. To forgive. Even when someone has hurt you, when they've cut you to the bone, when they've humiliated you. Fathers have to be an example of what it means to forgive. So in your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Pick it up please in verse 11. Luke 15 verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of the sons said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after that, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent everything he had, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and that person sent him into the fields to feed swine. We're talking about a Jew here, number one. You didn't associate with people that owned swine. You sure didn't go out and take care of the pigs. Now, if you was a Jew, but that's where he was going. He would have fain filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, because no man gave to him. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare, and here I perish with hunger? I will arise, go to my father, and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you before you. I'm no, worth, no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants." He arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed his son. Uh, and the son said unto his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Now as I look at this, I found something that uh, I think that I learned a little deeper and I want you to grasp hold of also. As Christians and men as Christian fathers, we are to always be looking to forgive. It's something we should want to do. It's something we should instruct our children to want to do, to look to do, because there's going to come a time in their life where you've messed up, where you've done wrong, and you're going to want their, their forgiveness, and you want them to be able to forgive. And that's what I learned from this reading here. The prodigal son, it said, had come to himself. There he is sitting out there with pigs in the slop, no money, no nothing to his name. And it says, John, he came to his senses. He's fortunate. Most people that live a, leave a godly home, that leave a godly lifestyle and they return or go into the ways of the world and they bury themselves in the sins and the muck of the world, rarely do they survive. Rarely do they repent. Rarely do they turn. So what made it possible that this boy sitting there in that situation came to his senses? If someone comes to their senses, tell me what they had to start with. They had a, some sense. They had a good example. They come from some kind of decent stock. That's the importance of you and I as fathers, as parents, that we teach our children, raise them up in the ways, the instruction of the Lord, so that when they do mess up, when they do vary off, when they do take the wrong exit, that maybe they can come to their senses. Maybe they can come to themselves. He realized that he had sinned against God. He realized he had sinned against his own father. 
He was ready to come home, but not as a son. No, he said, let me come as a hired servant. Now, the father had every reason to be mad. This boy had humiliated him by the way he lived. This boy had embarrassed him and made him look like a fool for the way he lived. After he had raised him the way that he should, him and his older brother both. Here this young one pops up, maybe a little bit more liberal than the brother. Maybe didn't need daddy's way no more. Maybe he's tired of being under daddy's thumb. Need to get away from daddy. I've got to live it and do it better my own way. He went out there and got in a lot of trouble, didn't he? And daddy could have been mad about that. He could say, you sorry thing. Look at you come dragging yourself behind here. After the way you've done me, you come home expecting me to help you out now. You expect me to pick you up. But I want you to look what happened as the son approached. He wasn't on the property. He was a long ways off. But as he approached, the father saw him in the distance. Why did the father see the son before the son saw the father? Why did the father see the son before the son saw the father? Why? He was looking. And what was he looking to do? What was he looking to do? To forgive him. Not to not to not for a reckoning. Not to get even, not to say what he had all built up all that time thinking about laying in the bed, how I'd all say to him next time I see him. He was looking for his son to forgive him. Like I said, the son wronged him. Same thing as slapped his daddy square across the jaw. That's what it felt like. How many of us would be so forgiven in such a situation? Think about it. Someone done us, especially close to us, like this boy just did his daddy. How many of us would be that forgiving? Be looking for an opportunity every day to forgive. How many of us sitting here could that be said about? It's said about this father right here. He didn't harbor hurt feelings and anger. Wanting vengeance. He was looking to forgive. And do you know why he was looking to forgive? Do you know why he wasn't so concerned about himself and him getting even? Do you know why? Because this man knew there was a God in heaven and that he wasn't him. He knew there was a greater judge that knew all things. This man would have believed that he needed a God in heaven to forgive him for everything he'd done wrong. And if he was going to expect that forgiveness, he was going to have to be looking to forgive himself. Do you see the moral to this story a little bit different now? The daddy was looking to do what every one of us in this room need to be looking to do against those that have harmed us, that have wronged us, that have insult, insulted us, that have humiliated us. We need as Christians to be looking to forgive because there's a God in heaven greater than us expecting us to forgive. He was so eager to forgive that it says he ran to him. He embraced him. He gave him kisses because the opportunity had finally presented itself. No, he wasn't looking to get him told. He wasn't looking to throw it all up in his face. The father was looking to simply Forgive one that had done him wrong. And that's a great story for us today. That's a great example for every Christian here today. He didn't spend his life gaining stomach ulcers and indigestion problems because he lived in hate and revenge. No, he looked daily to forgive. 
And we, the people of God, we need to be looking for the same thing, to forgive everybody that's done us wrong, to forgive and to go on, not waiting for that day of revenge, not waiting for that time to get even. We also need to be people that have a heart for people. Until we have a heart for people, we're never going to be able to forgive people. You have to have a heart for them. And I'd say this father had a heart for his son, would you not? Oh, he was no doubt crushed. No doubt countless tears by the old man had been shed of all the possibilities of this boy being what he wanted him to be, raising him in the ways of the Lord. No doubt there was fear every night and every day in his heart for the condition of this boy. But he had a heart for that boy. If he didn't, he would have never been able to have forgiven him. Having a proper attitude concerning ourselves, realizing we're not God, is important. But having a heart for people requires us to have the proper attitude about others. And the Apostle Paul says that we're to consider ourselves in the church as Christians, that we're to consider everyone around us as better and greater than us. If we did that and had that heart for people, we'd have no problem forgiving them when they'd done us wrong, when they said something that hurt our feelings. But we're bad for that in this country today. Aren't we the land of the offended? Ain't that what we are now? Everything offends us anymore. Things that offend us now, people a decade, few decades ago had laughed off and been no big deal to them. Now everybody's offended today and looking for a reason. Instead of that, we're supposed to be forgiving people. The father saw the son coming, it says in verse 20, from a distance away, from a distance away, said the father saw him coming and the father had compassion. He felt compassion. That meant his heart beat a little bit faster. You know, when you feel something and you, you no matter what to what degree it is, your heart goes into a little bit of an overkick, does it not? It goes into beating faster and faster and faster and that desire led him to have compassion it said upon his son he embraced him because he was moved with compassion. If your heart is not right towards people you cannot be moved towards compassion for them. Jesus, did he have compassion for people? It's because his heart was where it was needed to be. The apostle Paul had compassion. The apostles had compassion. You and I have known people with compassion for people. And that's the only way you're able to be a forgiving person is if you can be moved to compassion. And that's only possible if your heart is set right. He ran and embraced him, covered him with kisses. You know, our God's got a way about him, a way of forgiveness. Did you know that? Our God can forgive anything to anybody. But their heart has to be right. Their heart has to be repentant. Was this son, this son didn't come back down the road and say, listen here, old man. I'm out of money. I ain't got nothing left to my name. You're going to put me right back where I was. You're going to increase my weekly allowance. Uh, you're going to extend the, uh, the size of my room. And you're going to give me this. He didn't do that, did he? No, he came back repentant. I'm sorry. I'm not worthy to be your son. Let me be a hired slave. But did you notice in that story he never got the chance to say that? To, to that point, I mean, before the father ran to him and embraced him and had compassion, that boy hadn't said a word. But he was repentant. That's the way our God is. When we're repentant, he's ready and able to forgive. Hey, speaking of that, go to Psalm 86.5 real quick. Psalm 86.5, and I'll close real quick with these scriptures. Psalm 86, verse 5. This 
listen to what David says here. Psalm 86, 5, for thou, Lord, art good. Listen how he describes the Lord. You are good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon you. He wants us to be like him. Good, plenteous in mercy, ready to forgive. There's one more. Flip ahead to Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like unto thee? Who compares to God that pardoneth iniquity, passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever. Does that mean every now and then he gets angry at his children? Yep, just like a good daddy. And there's a price to be paid, but he doesn't hold on to his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Is that not beautiful? Is that not beautiful? God delights in showing mercy. Look back unto whom? And to all them that call upon him. You know, the Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, he was actually Saul of Tarsus. In Acts, the chapter, in Acts chapter 9, he was heading to Damascus uh, to destroy the church. He was going to bring Christian men and women back to Jerusalem and throw them in prison. He had consented to them stoning Stephen to death as he preached the gospel. Saul of Tarsus was a horrid individual. And as he was going to Damascus to do the same thing, we know that a bright light came and the Lord said, Hey, what are you doing to me? And the Lord said, and Paul said, Who art thou? And he says, I'm Jesus who you persecute. Go into the city and it'll be tell you, it'll tell you, you'll be told you what you need to do. Acts the ninth chapter, nowhere in that does it say Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. Nowhere. You know why? Because he wasn't. He goes into Damascus, Ananias meets him there, preaches and teaches it to him, and then Paul telling of his own conversion in Acts chapter 22, telling of his own conversion, said while he was sitting there, Ananias, after teaching him, said, Why do you sit there? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is not a verbal thing. Calling on the name of the Lord is you doing what he's told you to do. You say, Lord, I'm going to do what you told me to do. Save me and forgive me. That's calling on the Lord. And then what he has told us to do, we do. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We confess that before man. We repent and straightway, same hour of the night, same moment of the day, we're immersed, baptized to meet the blood of Jesus. Because Peter says, it's baptism that now saves us. Not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but taking all of our sins away. We go down into baptism, a repentant sinner, we come up a Christian. If we've called on him and obeyed what he said to do, we got a good father. He wants to forgive. He wants to be merciful. The question is, is will you repent and be obedient? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning. That invitation to all to hear that is outside the Lord are those that were once Christians that have fallen away. And yes, you can lose your salvation. You sure, sure can. Too many examples. We could, I could preach the next six hours on losing your salvation and it'd be biblically correct by that book right there, the Word of God. Maybe you've fallen away from your salvation like this boy did. It's time to repent and to come home. We'll stand and sing verse 1.